Hello and welcome to Supporting Positive Behavior in Continuous Learning Environments Part 1. This is a presentation webinar designed to support families who are now supporting our K-12 education system from home. My name is Lee Collier. I am a social worker uh, by training and I'm a program supervisor of special education and student support here at the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction, OSBI in Olympia, Washington. And this presentation is designed for families to support their students learning in the home environment and to talk about how to do how to support that, how to support behavior and how to support positive behavior um, from, from here at, at the OSBI offices. Our vision, mission, and values. Our vision is that all students are prepared for post-secondary pathways, career, and civic engagement. Our mission is to transform K-12 education to a system that is centered on closing opportunity gaps and is characterized by high expectations for all students and educators. We achieve this by developing equity-based policies and supports that empower educators, families, and communities. Our values are ensuring equity, collaboration, and service, and achieving excellence through continuous improvement, focus on the whole child. Our equity statement is that each student, family, and community possesses strengths and cultural knowledge that benefit their peers, educators, and schools. Ensuring educational equity goes beyond equality. It requires education leaders to examine the current policies and practices that result in disparate outcomes for our students of color. Students living in poverty and students receiving special education and English learner services. Students who identify as LGBTQ and highly mobile student populations require education leaders to develop an understanding of historical context, engage students, families, and community representatives as partners in decision-making and actively dismantle systemic barriers, replacing them with policies and practices that ensure all students have access to instruction and supports they need to be in schools. Our learning objectives today, to support families engaging in continuous learning, some trauma-informed guidance to engage with challenging behaviors, how to bridge the gap between our expectations and students' ability to meet those expectations, problem solving skills to support learners and engaging with escalating behaviors in the home. I'd like to acknowledge the work of Dr. Ross Green, Dr. Nicholas Long, James Freeman and Tony Reyes at Castle Pacifica Center for Children and Families and Fritz Radel, whose foundational work and research with, with, with aggressive children in, in the 50s led to much of the positive behavior work that we're looking at today. I also want to specifically thank contributions from Jen Kroll, Jen Cole, Director of Parent Training and Information at PAVE, a Partnership for Voices, Actions, and Empowerment, and Alexandria and Tony, Special Education Program and Supervisor here at OSPI with me. Let's get started. I'm not a teacher and you probably aren't either. Take a moment, breathe. Let's all acknowledge that it's okay with how hard this moment is right now. We would never ask you to do any other job that requires a master's degree with zero training or notice. But here we are. Many of you have spent years advocating and fighting for services and it feels like it's all being taken away. All I can say right now is that this can be a very positive experience for children and we should not let pressure from schools, teachers, or school community, social community, dictate what works for our family and what kind of learning we are prioritizing during this time. How much did you try to do? Right? We recommend creating a daily list of activities. These can include a combination of academic, leisure, or special activities, and functional living activities to build out the day. Build in breaks, and whenever possible, encourage students to co-develop the schedule with you by making small choices to build in their efficiency and their engagement. Because, you know, many students with disabilities respond well to visual cues, a schedule board, a tactile or digital, with images or activities that prompt students on what, can to, on what they can do and what would be helpful. In addition, something like using a kitchen timer or a phone alert, which reminds students of a bell schedule at school. Caregiving caregivers, sorry, may, may want to try having learning activities take place in different spaces in the home, in the, in the home or in different rooms. The students are used to shifting locations in the school depending on where they're learning. Being in the same place all day can be really hard. I know I started out having my daughter work right next to me and the other one across the room and they just argued over who got to be next to me. And then they got sick of being there and, and wanted to be in the, the preferred location. So we set up a system where they could rotate around. 
Many kids are nonverbal and need one-to-one -one direct instruction with multiple prompts or redirections. And many have intention and behavior deficits that are unable to independently complete most tasks. We're not gonna be able to put work in front of a lot of these kids and expect them to just do it. They're gonna need, if we're gonna be engaging in academic curriculum from the school, academic or any sort of instruction, many of them are gonna need one-to-one -one support to do that in time that. And you already know that. Just an important reminder, when working with schedules, it's important to encourage self-advocacy and functional communication by honoring requests for breaks or the use of a break card and requests for help whenever possible. Which website? Wait, what password? How do I use this? Why does all of this material read like stereo instructions? We venture into a new world with new materials and new expectations. I just wanna be the first to say, you're not expected to be the Steve Jobs of home learning. You can take your time to understand everything and even not use any of it if you don't want to or don't have the right hardware or resources. Please let your school district know if you do not have the necessary materials to support home learning that includes hardware, software, and access. If they are providing services virtually, there needs to be a way to get you those same services, either virtually or another way. Learning at home is valuable. Just being around you all day, watching what you do, how you do it, and how you support your family is incredibly valuable and should not be discounted because you aren't spending three hours a day on traditional academic learning. You are your child's greatest teacher. And now we have an opportunity to teach, practice, and study what you value. Embedding children in our routines can give them an incredible sense of purpose and begin with the development of soft skills, such as respect, responsibility, and grit that will serve them long into the future. Some of our students with disabilities haven't been included in their academic environments as much as we would have hoped. Home learning is a great time to practice skills in the home and model what it means to be inclusive in all aspects of home life. You decide what's important. Our modern American public school system is built upon values of the dominant society. You are potentially feeling pressures to match the academic rigor and pace your child had while in school. If your family and culture is not always reflected in those values, this is a great opportunity to focus on what you feel is important, what you value. Your home is the classroom now, and you get to decide what is important for your child to learn and what they need. Your school will be there to support you and support your home learning. Dr. Bruce Perry is an expert in trauma and trauma recovery. And he gives some pretty simple recommendations to families that I'm gonna share now. And how to get through all of this, because we're in the middle of a massive traumatic event for our world and for our country. Many students, many kids, many families are gonna to respond to this in really different ways. And some people are really struggling and some people are being really impacted and really traumatized to what's going on right now. These are Dr. Perry's recommendations to handle at this exact moment. As we said earlier, structure your day. As plans and expectations shift amid global crisis, we aim to continue routines with our children. Our children are more tolerant to stress when it's introduced in predictable ways, such as chores, bedtime routines. It's when stress is unpredictable and extreme and prolonged that children become more vulnerable rather than resilient. Family meals is that it, he, he features over and over again, and there's endless research on the importance of eating food together. Mealtime is a great way to preserve structure and routine while checking in with our children. If there are behavioral issues or family problems to discuss or things that happen during the day, you can ensure that our children feel safe and heard first. This will make them more receptive to our message. As Dr. Perry says, we must regulate people before we can possibly persuade them with a cognitive argument or compel them with an emotional affect. We can help children regulate and then relate and then reason. Ensuring our meals are nutrient dense and help our, our families handle the active stresses and response to time. Strong recommendation to limit media. While you're receiving so much information and being, being asked to do so many things on screens, it is great to break away from that as much as you can. While navigating our way through this pandemic, many of us are experiencing a state of fear and children are no exception. Just like the coronavirus, emotions are very contagious and children often sense when others are anxious and upset. In that state of fear, children rely more heavily on primitive parts of their brains and, and tend to act out. Exercise. 
Now is the time to be creative and get bodies moving while practicing social distance. As previously mentioned, when children are in a fearful state, they are in a heightened state of arousal, relying on lower functioning and brain regions. Reach out and connect. Connecting with others is one of our greatest tools. And as Dr. Perry tells us, the most powerful buffer in times of stress and distress is our social connectedness. So let's remember, stay physically distant, but emotionally close. Reach out and connect. Helping others. Many who experienced adversity in the past are in a state of sen sensitization. Start over. Help others. Many people who have experienced adversity in the past are in a state of sensitization and vulnerability. They may have experienced poverty, racism, violence, marginalization, increasing their risk for behaviors such as comfort eating, emotional isolation, sleep disruptions, and so on. Being there to reach out and help others during this time can, can be incredibly positive and affirming for children and help them maintain their own well-being. Practicing good sleep hygiene. It is not unusual for us to be in a heightened state of alarm during the pandemic, feeling the need to always be ready for a threat. Practicing good sleep habits is a great way to alleviate the stress of the day and let your brain reset and prepare for the next day. Staying positive and future focused. As mentioned previously, emotions are contagious. As Dr. Perry says, the same way anxiety and panic is contagious, so is calm. Don't underestimate the power of being calm to others and don't underestimate the impact of the dysregulated people around you. Staying calm, showing calm, practicing calm, practicing strategies to, to be calm and being calm around kids is gonna help them be calm with us. Well, what can we expect from the school? Well, included with this webinar are links to the continuous learning plan for 2020, which is OSPS guidance for, for schools and supporting exclusionary practices during sort of school facility closure, which is our special education documentation of how to best support kids during this time. These are lengthy documents of which there are webinars themselves to go over and explain these documents. But it really outlines if you have larger questions of what the school's responsibility is right now. Here's what I wanna say in general. This is gonna be different district to district and even building to building and even I can attest myself within the same school building. What if they haven't contacted you? Well, call, write the teacher first. After that, if, if they're not, you're not getting responsive in a reasonable amount of time, write the principal. And if the principal's unresponsive, then write the school district office. If the school district office is unresponsive to you again in a reasonable amount of time, that would be the time to call OSBI in our office, and we will do our best to support you. And I want to be really, really clear that you have the right to request an IEP meeting with social distancing practices in place. An IEP meeting can occur virtually and can occur potentially in person with social distancing practices in place if that's an availability. But again, after the buildings have reopened and, and we are able to engage in those processes again. Right now, while schools, buildings are mandated closed, that would have to occur virtually. There's no one right way to provide, provide services. The provision of FAPE can include many different things and as stated in the Office of Civil Rights guidance, the provision of FAPE may include, as appropriate, special education and related services provided through instruction that is provided virtually, online, or telephonically by the telephone. Many disability-related accommodations and modifications may be effectively provided online, such as extensions of time for assignments, videos with captioning or embedded sign language interpretation, accessible reading materials, a speech language service through video conferencing. OSBI encourages districts to meet with parents and discuss on a case-by-case -case basis, health and safety considerations. It should be the prior, and health and safety considerations should be the priority, including social distancing recommendations. These services will look different based on safety needs, student need, parent engagement, staffing configurations, regional need, and district systems. Additionally, there's not an expectation that IEP services would be delivered exactly as the IEP states, and providing support such as one-to-one -one paraeducator may not be needed at home or may not be feasible based on staffing configurations on say, and safety requirements. But if you are requesting one-to-one -one daily behavior support from the school district, even if it was written in your IEP, that is not going to be able to occur with our current guidelines in place from the governor. And 
generally, I must let you know that if you feel unsafe, you need to call someone for help. First off, call your primary care provider. Secondly, is a list, a link in, in, in this PowerPoint is a regional behavioral health organization contacts. You have to reach out and contact the BHOs in your area. Also, Washington's Mental Health Referral Service for Children and Teens that works around the state and can refer you to a provider in your area with or without health insurance. So also seeking some support from an organization called Guided Pathways. And if you really feel like you're, you're, if you're, you're in help that does not require 911, calling the Parent Family Trust Line for 1-800-932-HOPE, and that will uh, give you some guidance on, on supporting kids with, with some pretty, pretty high needs. What's going on with our kids right now? I don't know about you, but in my home, my kids are acting pretty differently. And I, I think I know why, but I can't always see it and figure it out in the moment. It takes me a pause and I'm going to remember what's going on in the world right now. The coronavirus has changed life dramatically for millions of children across this whole country. Even if you live in a part of this state that hasn't seen a lot of cases of COVID-19, even if you work hard to filter the news your kids sees and hears about the virus, life is different now. It's heavy and it's stressful in so many ways. And the more than one third of American adults at this point say that the pandemic has had a serious impact on their mental health. And even young children can pick up on that. But children don't always express their emotions in, in ways that adults expect. There's some potential signs of distress that mental health experts say parents should be on the lookout for. They're crying and arguing more often. They're falling back on old habits and behaviors. Their sleeping and eating patterns have changed. They're overdosing on screen time. They're clinging. And even though we're spending so much more time with them, they feel clingier than ever. Well, I firmly believe that behavior is communication and that maladaptive behavior is a cue for parents and teachers to support an emerging skill set for functional communication. Like, think about a kid who throws a book during a difficult assignment. It could be a cue that that student needs more support and asking for a break before escalation happens. So there's all these reasons that kids misbehave, right? Physical health problems, they feel sick. Social community problems, they you know, they don't have enough to they don't have enough to eat, or they they you're you're they're experiencing homelessness. They have an actual mental health diagnosis that, that causes symptoms. And this problem is caused by the school. That one we don't have to worry much about, but th it's still kind of embedded. There's a lot of pressure from the school that's still there. And traditionally what we've done, I know in many homes and, and, in, and in schools is we've punished kids. They, they don't do what we want. You consequence them and then they get better. But I, I gotta tell you, going back to the, next, the previous slide, these behaviors that are coming out of COVID, we're not gonna be able to punish these out of our kids. We, we need to start looking at things differently. Really kind of coming around to figure out what they need. How, how, how do we support their needs, even if they're asking for it in a way that we don't like? Because right, if, if, we, if the kid doesn't read, we teach. If the kid doesn't know how to swim, we teach. If they don't know how to multiply, we teach. If they don't know how to drive, we teach. And if they don't know how to behave, we punish them. How come we can't finish that last sentence as automatically as the last ones? Dr. Ross Green is the developer of a program called Collaborative Problem Solving. He says that challenging behavior is most likely to occur when the demands placed on a student exceed their capacity to respond adaptively or appropriately. Therefore, our usual expectations don't make more sense. He believes kids do well if they can, so do I. Challenging kids are challenging because they, they're lacking the skills not to be challenging. Kids display challenging behaviors when demands and expectations are being placed on them that outstrip their skills to have to respond adaptively. When we treat them as if they have a delay and we apply the same compassion we do with every other part of learning, we know they do a lot better. You may find that your kids are lacking gaps in different areas. We, this is sort of 
um, what Dr. Green calls the lagging skill areas. So there's executive functioning, which is sort of what we call the CEO of the brain. It's kids who make really bad choices all the time. I got one of those in my house. Or language processing, some of our kids who, uh, who shut down, who have struggled to find the words to talk, who just kind of act out rather than discuss their concerns. Emotional regulation, some kids who really struggle uh, emotionally. I got one of those in my house too. Kind of get really, really upset for things that I didn't really seem that big. And what you're noticing during COVID-19 and during this quarantine, my guess, is a lot of these kids who had these struggles before, the volume is turned up a bit on all of them. Right? So your kids who had problem with cognitive flexibility, the kids who get really frustrated and stuck in their, their, their thinking when you, they have a tougher time when you're gonna change the schedule on them. Something was promised that isn't gonna come through. They, you see now they get even more upset about that and dig in even harder. Our kids with social interaction, some I found, some of those kids are actually doing better right now because there's less kids around them. So they're actually doing better with social interaction because it's in smaller groups and smaller doses. But some of those kids, you'll notice, they're fighting with their siblings a lot more often than they were before. But here's how this works. Adult, in order for student growth to happen, for kids to change, adults have to change. We do this by making different environmental arrangements, by altering what's happening with people and applying positive consequences for appropriate behavior. But what happens a lot is that we respond to behavior. I have a kid who hits her sister. She hits her sister and her sister knows that was good. And that the consequence often is you get sent to your room. It changes. There's not always a natural consequence that way. It just depends. We have a lot of flexibility. But in reality, that consequence isn't working because she's still hitting her sister, right? The behavior was the, the hitting. The results were her sister definitely learned that she was upset with her. And I found out that she hit her sister. And the consequences were she was sent to her. But the next day, we still aren't figuring out what she hit her sister for and what's going on. What was the antecedent? What was the setting event? What was really going on? When we reduce antecedents, Actually, it turns out that it was unstructured time that I didn't plan for. I was on a call, and I, I had to send them somewhere else and push them outside to get off uh, away from me. They were mad and frustrated at me because I pushed them outside because I had to take a phone call. And now they're fighting over something that I, it was completely unregulated. I set this whole thing up. And we end up consequencing them for a behavior that I could have stopped myself. But I didn't think about the bigger picture at hand, and I was just mad that they interrupted my call by being by hitting each other. When adults change our behavior, we set them up for success. And I, I'll be honest, young kids and children with disabilities and students with, 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 with these acknowledged, again, back to these lagging skills, we know we have these problems. We know we have these lagging skills. We're not punishing these lagging skills out of these kids. We're not consequencing it out of them. We gotta set them up for success. Please turn into part two of this of this program